Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just looking to see uh, Brian Baker. Let me know he was going to be arriving a little bit late. Um, it looks like the rest of the board members are all here. Um, so tonight um, we've got a fairly full agenda with um, a focus for the meeting to be on the strategic plan and um, also to meet with the auditor. And uh, Linda, did you send to everyone the um, addition to the consent agenda, the contracts that- we Yes, had? I did. It was probably okay. 3.30, quarter four though. Okay. Um, so those, the there are some teacher contracts that the board just needs to approve. Those will be put into the consent agenda um, to be approved. Um, and Winton uh, asked if he could switch around uh, the agenda a little bit. His granddaughter is playing in a softball game. So I'm wondering, is the auditor here? Yes, Teresa's I here. I am, yep, yep, I'm here. Okay. Um, would you be willing to, um, we had this, the, um, Winton was going to be doing some presentation at 640. Um, oh, and at 640 right now, um, we're getting a little bit of a late start, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to go before him and that way we can accommodate his need to see his granddaughters. Uh, I can go time. whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. So we'll just switch that around. Um, and then I need a board member to volunteer to be the meeting evaluator. So do we have a board member willing? Okay, looks like Chelsea is willing to do that. And Chelsea, that you'll find in the, in the materials that Linda sent, there's a little evaluator form. Got it. All right. Awesome. So you can do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to move us right along to uh, community engagement. So this is an opportunity for folks from the community um, to share any uh, thoughts or concerns that they have. And I see Paul Parsons has raised his hand. Yes, I hope I'm doing this right. I'm actually the union representative, um, part of the liaison bargaining team for healthcare, and I wanted to give you and the public an update on negotiations since they've started on the 27th of April. Is this the appropriate time to do this, or I'm not uh, sure? <laughs> well, you have three minutes. Um, no problem. <laughs> so if you want to update us on that, that would be fine. Sure. Greetings, uh, my name is Paul Parsons and I am the driver's ed teacher at the high school. I'm here representing the OSEA as the liaison to the Vermont NEA Healthcare Council. As you're likely aware, negotiations over the next statewide health insurance agreement for Vermont's public school employees have begun. I want to briefly update you in the progress. Um, we believe that open communication between teachers, support staff and members of the board is critical to ensuring affordable, accessible, high quality healthcare for employees. As you know, we have a 10 person team with five commissioners appointed from the school boards association and five from the unions representing public school employees from NEA and ASME. We met for the first time on April 27th with the third party facilitator just to engage statements of purpose, interests and objectives. And they allowed them to ask clarifying questions and to set up for the next meeting. And here's what we're looking for. Um, and I think these are all pretty basic affordable access to all employees to high quality comprehensive health care, fairness and cost sharing, equity and health care affordability and access for low income school employees, most of whom are women, simplicity of benefit administration for VHI plans, HRAs and FSAs, effective and timely education about plan choices. And we support as a union all these principles as the goals of the bargaining team. Um, we look forward to a fair and reasonable settlement that protects and strengthens health care benefits for both the Orange Southwest Supervisor Union and the um, OSEA Union. 
And we recognize that, you know, healthcare in the United States is broken at this point in time. And we're looking for a mutual working arrangement to improve healthcare and keep our costs under control. Thank you for your time and look forward to continuing to update you on the conversation as the negotiations go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other member of the public wishing to speak? Okay. I, I would like to. <laughs> okay, Nora. Hi, thanks. Um, Nora Smolnik, I uh, resident of Brain. Temporarily lost you. Oh, she's back. I have no idea what happened there. So sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I've only been doing this for how long, right? <laughs> <laughs> Too long. Anyway, North School, <laughs> resident of Braintree, Vermont. Um, I teach um, at Randolph Elementary School, though this year I have been doing remote. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank the board for their um, recognition um, for the Teachers Appreciation um, Week. And um, I thought just, you know, I, I realize that most of you are aware, but I thought it would be good just to um, quickly state um, just some of what it's been like this year. Um, I spend often over 10 hours a day on my computer um, for meets, planning, grading students' work, looking for new activities to engage students um, in learning during this difficult time. Um, I deliver books and supplies and um, do all of that because our students are worth it. So, um, thank you. All righty. Do we have any other folks who would like to speak? Okay. I'm going to move us along then. Um, and I see that Winton has... Um, arrived. Winton, we were able to switch you with the auditor. So we're going to have um, the auditor go next. And then um, we have a, a brief just uh, discussion on board training. And then we'll start in with the strategic planning information. Yep. So, um, we'll hear from the auditor next. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, Teresa Kajenski from Fothergill, Sigali, and Valley, um, an audit firm in uh, Montpelier, Vermont. Um, we've been auditing you guys now for maybe five years, uh, definitely four years. I think maybe this was our fourth year. Um, I believe you guys all have copies of the audit and have received them. Um, I was going to kind of just go over the communication letter, which um, is just a three page letter that uh, is addressed to the school board members and management. Um, so the one thing I wanted to say that this was a clean audit, it's called an unqualified audit and um, it's the best audit that you can get. And excuse me. Oh, oh, excuse me. Hold on. I, my daughter, something's happened. I have to pause. Sure. So, um, while we're waiting on the auditor, as we listen to this report, uh, board members, we might want to just be looking at our, our 2.3 financial conditions policy to help us, um, Sort of evaluate how things are doing as well as our asset protection policy which is 2.6 um, just to help us but it sounds like our audit is in very good shape hopefully everything is okay with the auditor's daughter um, maybe what we can do just to keep us moving along is um, i will take 
um, because it's only about a five minute, um, we plan for about five minutes for this uh, discussion is just to talk a little bit about the training, uh, upcoming training for the board. Um, and I apologize, I sent it out to the board um, earlier, just some information about what we're looking at. So I've been in communication with Susan Mogensen. She's a policy governance uh, consultant out of Canada. Um, and she's been working with the Rutland, the Rutland Southeast uh, organization. Um, and then also she's been working with the district over in Bristol um, and, she, and um, she has a great program that sort of allows board members to get training online and to do it at your own speed. It's about five to six hours of sort of online videos and then um, we can come all together at our retreat and be able to kind of digest everything that everyone's learned and um, and then uh, have uh, an hour consultation with her at that point. And then um, as we look at our agenda for the for the coming year, sort of look at and have her help us facilitate sort of making that annual agenda and making sure we're um, clear on what our what uh, what we should be doing. So um, as the board chair, one of the things that is in my, my uh, role is to, is to make sure the board is functioning well and getting the education that we need. So um, given that we've tried to use VSBA folks um, in the past, Val Gardner is the one who um, has policy governance background she's often hard to um to schedule so i figured we might as well try this gal um the folks down in uh south of us and over in bristol have had um good success so that's sort of the plan um are there any questions hannah i know you were sort of wondering uh about sort of the process or how I came to decide that? Um, I, uh, yes, uh, the agenda item, I, I guess it's further along in the process than I thought it was. So I was surprised to get your email today um, describing a specific training with a specific person and a specific time commitment. Um, I thought this agenda item was something we were gonna discuss about what we, wanted to get out of the training, but um, I could have misunderstood where we were in the process. That was my concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see our auditor. Yeah, sorry about that. You made it back. Hopefully everything is okay. Um, and it's, you can- It's okay, up. yeah. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, so- Back to, there's a, the communication letter there, it's a three page letter that's attached to the audit. And I'm just gonna kind of talk about a couple of the um, items on there. Um, so again, the audit was a clean audit, it was a, called an unqualified audit. We had no specific um, significant deficiencies or findings to talk about. There's a couple suggestions that we have at the end of this letter, but nothing rose to the level of um, a significant deficiency. So uh, the first part, I just kind of wanted to say that there are um, something called corrected and uncorrected misstatements where we propose journal entries or we find things that might be a little bit off but are not material. And the things that we found that were um, not exactly right or chose not to do were four items. And one of them was um, the, in 2000, June 30, 2019, the compensated absences were a little bit understated. Um, the, the 2000, 
19 and 2020 um, prepaid assets were understated and that had to do with um, purchasing some equipment. Uh, the current year, so the 2020 um, FSA liability was a little bit overstated and uh, the accounts payable was a little bit understated. When we do a test, we look at things that get paid after the end of the year and see if they belong into, they should have been booked at June 30, 20. And we found a few and we decided that they were small enough not to book them. Uh, we only had um, two adjustments to the financial statements and they were not material. And that was a, uh, a very big improvement over the last couple of years. And a lot of it kind of had to do with the consolidating, you know, working things out. We had uh, no disagreements with management. Um, we didn't consult any other independent auditors for any help. Um, and then there's some other uh, issues that I wanted to talk about. One being there's still checkings and savings and investment accounts that are not, or at least at this point, which was I think even still a January um, that were not in OSSD's name, they were still in the old school's name. It's they've been slowly, you know, the big accounts obviously were transferred right away, but it's kind of like the small scholarships and and agency funds and, and stuff like that that have were not at that point all transferred over. They could be right now, but they weren't at the time that we issued this audit. Um, and again, We've been talking about this, but the scholarship funds and the agency funds really need to be in the accounting system and, and recorded in the accounting system. They're kind of done outside the accounting system and, you know, by different people in the schools. And we have to kind of pull that together. Um, so I, I really think those really need to be done in the general ledger along with everything else in the system. Um, there are something called GASB 54, which has to do with a uh, fund balance reporting. Um, you, the board needs to adopt a policy um, to discuss the different levels of the fund balance. And this has just never been done up today. Um, Robin did reach out to me and ask for a, a policy that I could give you guys as an example. So I will forward one to her. Uh, probably next week or later on this week. Um, and so we Teresa, do continue to recommend that. Yes. Can I just, what, do, what exactly does that mean? Um, so GASB 54 is, so GASB is a governing board that um, basically tells all governments how, what policies they have to follow. And so GASB 54 has to do with fund balance reporting and governmental fund type definitions. And so there's different levels. There's um, committed, assigned, and restricted. And there's and you, the school has to, or the district has to have a policy that states what each level does. You have to follow the state, but you also have to say, maybe the board can assign, maybe some, some people have, the business manager might be able to assign certain stuff, certain fund balances. So um, I, when you go to adopt the policy, you'll see what each levels are, then you guys need to decide what level of management has the ability to do that. Okay. Um, so when I give you some examples of some ones that other, I mean, most schools adopted it right away. I don't know, you know, we weren't doing the audit at this point. Um, you know, it's kind of just like a, a standard comes up and you usually just kind of follow that, but it did take some action of the board to have it happen. Um, so the, the other issue, what happened due to COVID like everything else, there was some new funds that had to be done according to the state, basically moving expenses out of, and you're probably well aware of this, but moving expenses out of your general fund into a separate fund because you're going to get the COVID money that, that 
covered those costs. And so that was, there's about 410,000 or so of um, funds that you, you know, you didn't really overspend in those areas, but the COVID money was going to cover. So you'll see on in the audit on page of the PDF, it's page 12 of the audit. It's on page 11. And it shows, you know, there was so much assigned for future budgets having to do with COVID. And that, that was something that was different than the previous year. Um, you guys have, you know, you had about 1.7 million that was really a fund balance that was ava available for future budgets. And, and I believe that you, in the March meeting, um, set aside some of that to, you know, to help with your balancing of your budget. I don't have that exact number. I didn't look it up, but I know Robin was working on that. So um, maybe even, maybe you guys even voted. I think you guys voted on that in January and then it goes out to the, to the voters. Um, but so I don't, you know, the biggest thing that I would like to kind of see get done again is really just making sure that you get all of those funds transferred out of those out of the other schools name that really don't they really don't exist anymore um, and into the the district's name and then you should adopt that policy it's not a huge thing really because the way that vermont works right is anything that is left any fund balance that's left over is either used for the next budget or you guys can assign certain things according to law um, but, uh, so, I mean, I can talk about the numbers with you guys, but this, you know, it's, again, it's a year ago's numbers and I don't, I, I can't even imagine how much more COVID money you guys ended up getting, but I'm sure it was quite a bit. And that will probably be what your single audit has to be dealt with for, uh, June 30, 21. Lane, do you know what the total COVID dollars were that you're getting? Must be up there. What, what they will be, uh, about four to four and a half million between the, the three ESSER, ESSER uh, distributions. Yep. Okay. Um, so do board members have any questions for Teresa? So what, what I'm hearing you say, Teresa, is pretty much we have a, a, a very clean audit. Um, the, can you, so when you say there are different, there are a couple of straggling accounts that are in the wrong school name, are they in OSSU or is it like Randolph Elementary School or something like that? And they just need to be transferred to OSUD? Yeah, a lot of it was OSSU. I think one was an extracurricular account at Braintree. Um, we actually, we fought with a bank for a while because um, they wouldn't allow us to transfer it into the new names until we had the old name of the person that signed up for the account originally, which can who, person who can no longer be found, um, signed off on it. So we've been going through a legal process to try to get these changes to happen. So this has been a work in progress for six, seven months now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's widespread between every school. Um, and it's really all the student activities and some of the scholarships, like the, you know, the main accounts were already transferred because you got, that was much easier, right, to do. Um, but, you know, there's the, the amount of, you know, little $300 account here, a thousand dollar account there. I mean, it's just, and trying to get all those is in, in itself is, it's just crazy. Um, in a way it's kind of there, it would be, and I think you slowly were doing this, just trying to consolidate all these, this money. Cause it's just, it's time consuming and they get lost really. I mean, cause they, they kind of stopped sending out statements for some of that stuff. <laughs> uh, so. and, and some of it too. And I'm, I'm in agreement with, with Teresa on the, uh, 
you know, the consolidation to get all the accounts under the same general ledger. Um, we were planning on doing that four years ago, and then the state stepped in and said, hey, we're going to require you all to have the same financial software system, so wait until the software system. So we've been waiting until the new financial software system comes in from the state that's capable of doing this, but they're at the point now where that software has been so historically bad that they are having discussions now about whether they're just going to dump it. So we've been waiting for five years to get the, the software from the state that they were going to mandate us to use to be able to make this transition. And every year it gets delayed because of these problems. And so that's the reason that this one's kind of hung out there so long, just so people are, are in the loop. So the intent is there. We just eventually we may, you know, if the state finally dumps it, then it means that all the districts will go and buy their own, you know, upgraded software packages, which we'll have to do too. Uh, but they haven't made a definitive ruling on it yet. Uh, Lane, I hadn't heard that they were thinking of letting that software go. I know there's a lot of people oh. that are not happy with it. it yeah, no, they set up a, they set up a group of people to study it and research it to see if it could be saved. And so we're expecting to hear something within the next next uh, four to six months. Yeah. Good. Okay. Do we have any other questions regarding the um, the audit? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you. And uh, you guys have a good night. All righty. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So we, we sort of rushed through the, the training discussion and plan. It seemed like there weren't any other um, issues. I'm just wondering um, if we want to revisit that before we um, head to Winton, we've got 10 minutes because we switched Winton with the auditor. So um, if, if people have any questions or concerns about, I'm assuming that um, because this training, it's allowed, you can do it on your own time. And it's about five to six hours of commitment between say the mid middle of May when we can get access to it through to our first, our, our retreat board meeting, which will be in July. That gives folks quite a bit of time to try and digest that information. And again, basically what it is, is the tutorial is gonna move us all sort of through how our policies work, um, what the philosophy is behind them. And, um, and then hopefully uh, in that July retreat, the first hour we can meet with Susan and just make sure that everybody sort of understands those concepts. In the training itself, there's going to be some uh, some little quizzes so that you really sort of um, have to uh, get a, a good understanding of that information. And then we'll have access to that information for six months from uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, I can get things started by mid-May so that you'll have access to it and we'll have a good um, six months of access to that uh, training material to review if we're sort of struggling with a certain concept within it. And if, if I, I don't mean to be a negative Nelly here, but mm -hmm. um, the the time commitment, I, I understand wanting to put that much time into training, and I understand it to the extent that I do training on my own time, and what I thought the training using our meeting time would be much more in person. So is, is this about wanting to make sure that we're attending the same training and all getting the information? Because six hours on top of the training that I've tried to do on my own, on top of my full-time job and my parenting, it, it, it's a lot, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And then to come to the training and just kind of uh, summarize it together or, or, or a quiz on it, I, I, I see the value. I don't mean to be dismissive. Um, I, I just feel the need to bring up that that's a big time commitment for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about some, do other, are other folks feeling a similar, Katya, go ahead. 
Um, and I, I apologize, my camera's off. My internet for some reason is keeps wanting to fade out when I put my camera on. Um, I just had a question regarding, um, I'm assuming this goes through our like board training budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we all vote on that, yes? That was my that was my question as well. I'm assuming that if we're spending board <clears throat> funds, then we would have that would have to be a board vote to spend those funds on a topic like this. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, there is we are supposed to budget. I'm looking at our policies right now. Um, and um, the budget is is set each year and um, at the at the agenda meeting I spoke with Lane and he there we are we have enough money um, for for the training um, in there and if we needed a little bit extra Lane had said that um, he would be able to to make that that up so um, and the cost I had it figured on one and uh, so it's let me just I can do the math quickly here um, so Lane will be doing this training with us so it'll be um, three thousand seven hundred dollars and the last I had heard from Robin we had um, we had that money in the budget, but we hadn't finished out um, the payments for Winton. So um, it sort of depends on on that coming in. But Lane had said that we would have enough to cover it. And hopefully, Hannah, with this training, you won't have to do additional training on top of this training. This hopefully can replace your your the training that you're trying to do on your own. Well, this is on one topic and the you know, they offer the VSBA, the emails come in and they offer lots of different topics. So it 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 won't replace what I'm trying to learn about them. Okay. Well, given our policies and given some of the difficulties we've had, just sort of making sure we're understanding our policies and following our policies. Um, as the board chair, one of one of my the, the job description for me is that I'm, I'm supposed to be working with the board to get the board so that we're performing well um, and performing uh, according to our our policies. So um, I feel like this is a, a, a good option if you, you know, we all have time commitments. So if you, if you don't quite get to everything, as I said, you're going to have access, we're going to have access to this information for six months starting mid-May. So if you, if it turns out you don't quite get to everything, you know, you'll, you'll be able to, to have access to it. Any other board members um, feeling like this time commitment so is uh, too much? Okay, so I'm going to move on then to our next uh, agenda item, which will be um, Witten's uh, presentation of where we are with um, the strategic planning process. And Winton, before you get started, did your granddaughter how'd the how'd the game go? We won five to two. Woo! All right. And it didn't and it didn't thunder and lightning. Awesome. All right. Well, you've got No, to go. actually uh, it it's part, partly sunny and uh, nice here in the Smoky Mountains of southwestern North Carolina. So happy to be with you. Uh, let me switch to uh, full screen, and I'm going to take you through uh, files, most of which I have uh, received about a week ago. Uh, there have been some updates, but I'm going to start with uh, just an overview and background. And we actually started having a conversation, I think, last 
fall when Susan Holson did a, a board development activity uh, with the OSSD board. And from that, you decided that you wanted to uh, focus on some key goals. Uh, it would be middle school and high school. And in middle school and high school, looking at uh, culture and climate, looking at academics uh, for both middle school and high school, looking at transitions from elementary to middle to high school. And so it was with that charge that uh, we moved forward. And with the 16 member design team, it started with 15, uh, but it really felt like Lane needed to uh, be with us so that we had a good ear to the ground and understanding what was already happening. Uh, the design team, and I'll introduce them uh, in, in a moment here, uh, we met 11 times. Uh, each design team member participated in two feedback forums, some even more than that. We hosted two sets of forums, one for the middle school, one for the high school. We had 68 individuals in each of those feedback forums. We also posted and analyzed a school and community survey. Uh, we had 143 respondents. There were some concerns about limited explanation for each question and use of education jargon. Uh, the problem was in Google Form, you're limited to only a, a small amount of information. And it was hard to describe uh, in more uh, in fuller detail uh, the information that people might have wanted to have had. However, afterwards, I sent out uh, a glossary of education jargon terms so that it would help people at least better understand uh, some of the things that they didn't know. Uh, we performed as a design team a crosswalk between the forum data and the survey data. And from that, the design team created a vision, a mission statement, uh, beliefs, core beliefs, uh, and a goal matrix. And also we're working on website graphics that will help to better uh, create the uh, uh, deeper understanding for what the strategic plan means and how we're going to monitor it. In addition, uh, I'm going to be sending out uh, tomorrow to the administrative cabinet. Uh, they're going to be giving us feedback on the goal matrix. And also tomorrow, I'm going to be sending out uh, to uh, the community uh, broadly uh, what I'm sharing with you tonight. And we're going to give them a, a, a week to respond, any ideas, any questions they might have. And this is in addition to the 143 people that filled out the survey, the 100 or so people who were in the forums. And um, then the, the final design team meeting will be next week on the 17th. And right now what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce the design team. Uh, we specifically uh, sought members from a broad uh, group of stakeholders, uh, starting with Wilder Grimes, who was a high school junior. Uh, Kayla Link is a teacher at uh, Randolph Elementary. Richard Hayward is a Brookfield Elementary teacher. Gus Howe Johnson is a Randolph Elementary teacher. Haley Pratt is a teacher from Brookfield Elementary. James Wesselcouch, uh, an elementary um, teacher. I think he's a music teacher. Daisy Mendez is a high school parent. Heidi Arias is a nonprofit organization. Elementary parent also runs the, uh, the recreation department. David White is a middle school parent. Jeff Higgins, a, a Brookfield elementary parent and works at uh, Vermont Tech. David Roller, an elementary administrator. Lisa Floyd is a middle school administrator. Lindsay Hopt is a uh, Braintree Elementary parent and business owner. Ann Kaplan, whom you know well, uh, is a member of the uh, OSSD school board. Kelsey Albandia, Randolph Middle School teacher. And that's the, that's the list along with, with Lane. Uh, I'm now gonna take you to kind of the product of uh, the work that we've done. And it, it looks like it wouldn't take too long to get to this point, but I have to tell you that it, uh, it was an arduous process. Uh, we looked at lots of different vision statements and the, the definition of, of vision is uh, the vision statement focused 
focus on tomorrow and what an organization wants to ultimately become. And the, the vision statement that we're sharing with you tonight is a path for all to learn, think, grow, and achieve. The mission statement is what drives the organization. It's what you do, the core of the business. And from it, finally, what it takes to reach those objectives. It also shapes the organization's culture. And vision statements are good to be short and succinct. Mission statements are more all-encompassing. So the OSSD is a community that empowers students of all backgrounds to discover and pursue their unique passions, build diverse relationships, and develop their knowledge and skills for purposeful futures as successful adults and citizens. The belief statements are the values upon which goals are developed and education decisions are made. And I'm not going to read all of these. I trust that you have them uh, before you, but I'm just going to highlight uh, a few of them. And they all start with, we believe. And so the first one, educators and families together inspire students to confidently advocate for and design growth experiences and personal learning plans that help them define who they are and where they're headed as adults. Another one, all students and staff are invaluable and have access to a learning and working environment that fosters physical and emotional health. And the last one, students require staff who have access to ongoing deep investments in training, professional development, and support. And at that point, I'm just going to shut off my screen and just ask your thoughts. Um, any, any immediate uh, response, anything you like, anything you don't like, anything you need more, further clarification on before I take you to a much more comprehensive goal matrix. Any, anything jump out at you here? Yeah, I had, this is Brian. Um, I had kind of just one on the, uh, the list of the goals. The, uh, the one uh -huh. goal about being an environmental steward, it just yeah. seems kind of out of place with all the other goals because okay. every other now, goal talks about students and staff and parents, and that one, it just seems okay. kind of out of place, or maybe it's the way it's written, but it, uh, okay. it just looks kind of, right. doesn't kind of fit in with the, all the other goals. Okay, let me just underline it, and I will take that back to a uh, design team. And just for the side note, uh, look at fit and language. Okay. Any other thoughts, anything jump out at you? All right. Let me then move to well, the on, goal matrix. Chelsea, hold on, Whitney. Yeah. Chelsea Sprague had a, had a hand up. Okay. Hi, um, this is Chelsea. I, so in the mission statement, the OSSD is a community that empowers students of all backgrounds to discover blah, blah, blah. There's not anything that ties it to the school and education and learning. I don't know if that is on purpose, if that went back and forth, but in, I mean, that could be sort of a mission statement for, I mean, I guess saying students, so they are in the school, but I don't know, it would seem that you would wanna tie that in somehow, but. Okay, I'm just looking at, I'm hearing your response. So we were saying that knowledge and skills, developing knowledge and skills doesn't to quite do it yet? Um, I mean, maybe it does, but when I read it, I was like, is this for the school or what is this? Is this for the 
educators for this. I mean, I, maybe I need to read it a few more times in order to fully understand it. Okay. Um, yeah. But just something I noticed at All first right. glance. Okay. I'll underline that. Any other thoughts, concerns, anything that you particularly liked, didn't like? Can I say one more thing? <laughs> sure. This is Chelsea again. Um, so I really like that for all of the goals or we believe belief statements, yeah. that it all seems super positive, which I think is really important and refreshing. Okay, beautiful, thank you. Any, any other good, bad or uglies? Here. Okay. I'll just give a you know two thumbs up on that um, the B statement about um, all uh, students are continuously challenged academically and encouraged to reach their next level of proficiency, um, and I think that is one that okay. really needs to be highlighted and uh, pushed ahead i think that okay. should be thank you a number one on the list okay okay thank you any other thoughts or issues any concerns okay and if, if something comes up, uh, tell me, we'll come back to it. Uh, this next one, uh, we're definitely not going to go line by line, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, we've talked about vision and mission and belief statements. This, the goal matrix is where the rubber hits the road. You can see in the legend that uh, we have some school board roles that are in red, superintendent role in green, other role uh, individuals are in black and also uh, to the best of our ability with the consultation with Lane and David Roller and Lisa and the design team we identified existing initiatives in brown and new initiatives in blue we also here identified uh, what would be paid for under current school budget and what might be paid for in COVID funds and so there are four theme areas, and I'm going to I'm going to take you through the theme areas first, and then I'll come back and kind of uh, go laterally from left to right, and take you through the goal, the action step, benchmarks, the timeline, who's responsible for shing it through and reporting on progress, then what's the fund source. So the four areas, and and again, this came from uh, the feedback forums. It came from the surveys. The design team amalgamated uh, many, many pages and, and a great deal of feedback into four theme areas. And the first is school culture and climate. The second is communication and relationship building. The third is foundational knowledge. And we built on the foundational knowledge that you're already working on. And you'll see there's some brown, and you'll see there's some blue. And again, brown was what's currently happening, and blue is uh, what is being recommended to happen. And you see it's a pretty long list under foundational knowledge. And then the final one is personal development skills. And so what I think I'll do is I'll work backwards to, to forward, so we heard a lot about social emotional learning and uh, recognizing that SEL doesn't mean a lot to folks. Uh, as often as we could, we put in what it actually stands for and then the acronym. And then as you work through the benchmarks, you'll just see it as SEL. Uh, but there's quite a bit in this component uh, with partnerships with Clara Martin 
the Clara Martin Center, uh, the RISE program, which is ongoing, but also you'll see with the COVID plan, uh, hire additional mental health staff for elementary, middle, and high school, and that's using COVID funds. Hire an outreach coordinator to help families. Uh, this this uh, pandemic has really, uh, has really impacted schools, not just in your, your district, but across the state and across the country, and for that matter, across the world. Uh, so you'll see um, kind of a, a sorting uh, of current and future. You'll see some dates here. We've got to do a little bit more refinement and what I'm going to share with you right now before I go back through, just to kind of give you a little different idea of how we're going to keep track of this. This is a, this is a map. Of, and what it does, it's hard to see, but what it uh, is designed to do is to be a one pager and it talks about the mission, vision, and strategic plan, and how that moved through, how we received stakeholder feedback. Uh, we identified the four themes. This one shows five, because I'm using a similar uh, diagram in another district, and they had five themes. I'm working with one of your tech center teachers to turn it into a four, four theme category. And then uh, from the start, we're gonna look at what are the big priorities for 21, 22, uh, 22, 23, uh, for uh, at least three years out, and then just points on each of those theme areas that folks on your website can take a look at this. They can know what uh, the main themes are, and then if they wanna know more detail, then they go into the goal matrix. And so there'll be an alignment between this goal matrix and the theme area I'm talking about, for example, right now is personal development skills. You'll see that as one of those colored strands. All right, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things as I work back through. Uh, this one is on foundational knowledge. And these are currently are items you're working on. Increase the number of students achieving proficiency on the Vermont Science Assessment. And your goal right now is 70% or more of your students will reach or exceed proficiency threshold on that assessment. Uh, I know and Lane has, uh, has told me uh, this is 2019 data and your data is just coming to fruition uh, very soon and it's much better than this, but I'd rather, I'd rather uh, start with what it was and uh, show great progress than to shoot too high and and not achieve it. But you can see that you're concentrating on students in grades eight and 11, 27% uh, exceeding the proficiency threshold. Uh, we want that to be 70%. And so we'll look at incremental growth each year for the next at least three years. And you'll see there are different roles. There's a role for the school board in here because your policy governance uh, ends report Lane will be reporting to you on what that progress is. And so that's the way to think about this goal matrix. You'll see another one is English and language arts, and that's on an SBAC assessment. And then you have some new, uh, some new focus areas. Uh, the state requires all schools to have a personal learning plan for all students in grades seven through 12. Uh, this one uh, will help um, bring that into compliance, but we also heard quite a bit of feedback from parents and community members on the importance of connecting uh, job career clusters and academic learning. And so that's the intent here. You can see this is the longest list and it just makes sense that schools are primarily about academic learning, but they're also social emotional learning. They're also how to build uh, teamwork, and skills. This one is communications and relationship building. Uh, one goal is improve two-way communication between families and schools. An action step, survey teachers and families to determine uh, preferred two-way communication systems. 
work with administrators and teachers to develop monthly communication intervals and content for families. So it isn't just that the schools are telling families what's happening, it's that it's a two-way communication, and that's, that's an important goal. And then finally, uh, looking at school culture, the goal is assess school culture and climate from student, teacher, and family's perspective. Student voice was a very big uh, feedback component. We heard a lot of people saying it's very important that students uh, take ownership in their learning. Maybe not first graders as much, but as you work through the continuum, more and more uh, participation. You already use the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. One of the suggestions here is to survey students, parents, and teachers on uh, their voice and aspirations in a, in a survey. So again, this, these are all recommendations. They're gonna be fluid and flexible. Uh, you'll have an opportunity as a board uh, to flex that plan. Um, and any good plan always has that kind of flexibility. We may have very, uh, very good uh, ideas and intentions things get in the way and COVID is a prime example of how things get in the way of uh, goals that we have planned out but the the most important piece is if you don't plan for the future you're not going to be able to accomplish uh, everything that you ordinarily or otherwise would have with the resources that uh, the taxpayers are providing for school leaders so in a nutshell uh, what i've talked about is the design team uh, the vision, the mission, the belief statements, the goals. And we'll have that refined for you uh, to come back to the board in June with the presentation of the final plan. And I think that's around the 24th of June, if I'm correct, Lane. And uh, we'll hand that off to you. Uh, one of the most important things that a board can do here is to make sure that uh, you at least get an annual report on the progress of strategic plan uh, and maybe even a semi-annual report uh, because the plan will do no one any good if it sets on a shelf and is not activated so that give and take and shared leadership role uh, between the board administrators teachers parents and community are what makes it a living strategic plan. And with that, I'll, I'll step back and ask you um, any other thoughts you have on the goal matrix and how that uh, we might move forward with implementing your strategic plan. Yeah, I see someone's hand. That's a couple of hands. Go ahead. Talk to you. Sure, I'll go. Um, I was just kind of surprised, and maybe I mean, I've read through the document a few times, but um, that there was no. I think going into it, we had that um, the the middle school development was kind of a topic that the uh -huh. board had seen as kind of something that we would um, potentially work on, and obviously going to the strategic plan of what the community wants is very important, but I was just kind of surprised to see that there was not much feedback um, regarding that from the community. Oh, there was there was a lot of feedback about middle school. Um, so where is that represented then? Did in you not, did not see that represented? Well, uh, I'd have to take a look, but let me make a side note and make sure that uh, we indeed uh, did do that. I'm just going to make these notes up here. Uh, a lot of feedback about the transition from middle school to high school and from elementary to middle school. I'm quite sure it's been a couple of days since I've looked at that. Winton, this Some of these may not. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, a lot of the feedback was really mixed. And so we set a goal around continued exploration and continuing 
to hold conversation and forums and try to get to some sort of consensus because we have some really strong opinions on both sides of things. Uh, again, I'm referencing my memory at this moment, but I think our goal was around yeah. continued exploration and development of a united vision as a community. Brian and Chelsea, your hands okay. are still raised. I'm, I'm not sure if you still have questions or if they just forgot to unclick. <laughs> any any other questions for Winton from the board? Okay. Well, if if you have some questions, that don't be bashful about sending me, an, sending me an email, and I'll certainly bring that up uh, with the design team. This is a very fluid process. Uh, we, we gave it our best shot after 11 meetings and synthesizing the feedback that we received in really three different ways. And if we've missed any steps, it would be good to know that now. And the other piece, as we move forward, we're handing that off to the administrators and, and to the school board. Um, and you can make changes as, as you see fit. We are just uh, providing you with a foundation from which to continue to strengthen that plan as you move forward. Any other thoughts or issues before I... Uh, no thoughts, just appreciate the uh, presentation, Winton. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Well, we'll be in touch. I'll see you in June. And go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And the board now has it, so they can take, they can uh, peruse it a little bit more if they'd like and, and get back to yes. you with some feedback. Right, and if you have feedback, um, go into the, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, Linda uh, sent you, Linda Lubold sent you a document that uh, you may be able to comment uh, in the side margin. And if so, uh, go ahead and do that. I'm happy to hear from you. And I'll certainly bring that up to the design team next week. Okay. Well, I'm signing off from uh, sunny North Carolina where the birds are singing and the roses are out. So I hope you don't have any snow. I know we left snow, but you can keep it. So with that, thanks a lot and we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you very much, Linton. Okay. So we're going to move on. Um, to uh, just a brief uh, first reading of the Executive Limitations Report uh, 2.7. So, Lane, do you want to? I can give a, a general overview. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so, this is in the, the report. This is the first reading. So, it'll come back uh, before the board at the next meeting. Um, Give you a chance to kind of digest it and then uh, ask any questions that you have along the way but um, executive limitations report 2.7 uh, it really kind of relates to the compensation and benefits uh, that the district provides to non-unionized staff um, as well as like outside contractors and it's really meant to ensure that we pro what we're providing these folks is reasonable um, is comparable to the local market markets that we deal with for these services and that we're not entering into agreements that are in excess of our rev revenues um, and that's kind of the, the basic gist of it this is a, a shorter one than most and it kind of ends up the uh, executive limitations review cycle for for this school year okay and board members can always um, go down and speak to Lane individually um, just to get further information if you want um and see the data 
um, to see the actual documents that, that support that report. So next up on the agenda is, um, again, Lane, to speak briefly about any uh, potential legislation that you see coming our way that may have an impact on public education in hopefully positive light and not a <laughs> negative light. Yeah, there's actually, there's a few that they're working on and it, it's kind of funny um, to kind of watch their process uh, because things change so much over time. You know, I'm the kind of person that's like, just tell, tell me at the end what you guys came up with and you know, that, that's what we'll, we'll work with. But I think there's two or three out there that are worth mentioning right now. There's um, House Bill 171, uh, which deals with financing the state's child care system, right? They've recognized, especially after COVID, the need for um, child care for, for, for younger children. Um, and they're really focused on trying to find a way to provide affordable access to high quality child care and early education for students across the state. Um, what they're talking about right now, the session got back in session today, um, is the creation of scholarships to support the education of child care workers, people who work in the field, um, because it is a, it's got some of the highest levels of regulation that I, I've ever seen outside of, um, you know, the, the food programs. Um, and so, and they don't have a lot of people that, that, are, that, that are interested. So I think they're trying to spur um, the ability to get more people um, that are willing to kind of enter this field and help out with the problem that Vermont's facing. Um, another thing that they're talking about right now is kind of mandating a study um, to really try to get a handle on what's needed and what the financial impact is going to be. And um, part of the study is also looking at is, well, you know, if we recommend these things and the state does it, this will be the financial benefit. And so that'll be presented at some point in the future to the legislature to, to make some, some changes that, that, that connect it with budget and to put a plan in place to get this running. Um, there's also House Bill H-26, which is looking at addressing the needs and conditions of the public school facilities across the state of Vermont. Um, there have been different discussions about this over the past couple of years prior to COVID. They were talking about taking the moratorium off of providing matching funds for schools uh, to do renovation projects or to build schools. Um, but I think COVID uh, made them realize in, in pretty harsh terms um, that a lot of schools across the state read some need some real infrastructure work, especially in terms of HCAC. So what they're gonna do with this bill, if it passes, is again, they're gonna reach out to a group to conduct a study. It's gonna assess the current state of the facilities across Vermont, and then come back to the, the General Assembly and inform it of the highest needs uh, based upon that study, so that the General Assembly can start putting a, a plan together to address them. Um, one of the other ones that I hadn't heard much about before, uh, but it actually came down from the Senate, um, is, is Senate Bill 16, uh, which is a task force uh, to examine school exclusion. Um, its focus is really on deciding what fraction, infractions, um, discipline infractions that students have that should result in suspension or expulsion. Um, and it's really geared towards uh, studying those exclusionary practices as they relate um, to, to students of color and to the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, historically, um, members of those subgroups um, tend to get hit a lot harder and a lot more frequently with these more severe um, infractions. And so it's putting a, a more um, equitable system in place is what it's looking at. Again, it's a study that will come back and inform the legislation so that they can make uh, the best decisions possible about how to move forward. And then the last thing, um, you know, Paul Parsons spoke about at the very beginning, um, and that's uh, the healthcare negotiations, right? We're back into that next round, um, right? It's done at the state level, but it may have a significant impact on our own budgetary processes. And it's too early uh, in those sessions and negotiations to know where things stand and what potential impacts um, might be. So those I think are the biggest ones that are you know still on the table. Um, actually, they were on the agendas today for the legislative session that they had. 
Great. Any any questions for Lane? Part part of our role as a board is to um, gather from Lane sort of the impact um, on on our particular district, but also to um, be aware and to advocate for things that we feel will will um, be positive for public education. So, um, are there some that you think are are really um, with our efforts in advocacy? I think, uh, and again, it's it's the study and what comes out of it, and then making sure that people move on it. But but I think the public school facilities piece is huge. Um, you know, one of the reasons that Vermont went through all the changes it did in adopting the end funding system was for equality, right? You had rich towns, you had poor towns, you had schools that hadn't seen a dime in extra money for 100 years and, and some where the money was flowing through the schools regularly and were quite impressive structures um, and quite impressive resources. And so ed funding kind of provided equalization and it was kind of neat, like I said, coming back to Vermont after being out 20 years and seeing that all the schools in terms of their facilities were kind of in the same shape and the kid had kind of, kids had kind of equal access no matter where they went. But this lack of, um, for many years, of not providing additional funding uh, to help the poorer districts uh, do some capital projects to keep their facilities in the shape that they should be in is an equity issue in itself. It's, it's not addressed. You know, we're going to end up back, um, not us in, 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 in necessarily in OSSD, but the state itself is going to end up back in, in, in that state if they don't do something about this relatively soon. And so I think that that one is, is very high priority um, for me, at least. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next up, we have um, our consent agenda where um, we need to approve the minutes from the last uh, meeting. We need to approve the administrator uh, contracts or administrative contracts, and then those uh, teacher contracts that Linda had to um, add uh, a little bit later this afternoon. Um, so um, unless, does anybody see, uh, do we have a reason to discuss any of those particular items on the consent agenda or are we ready to vote to approve the consent agenda? Can I have a motion? I make approve? a motion oh. that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second, Katja. Thanks, Katja. All those in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Okay. Uh, did you get all of those, Linda? I believe it was unanimous. If you just ask if if there's any no's, that would be great. Okay. Do we have any uh, no's or nays? Okay. The A's have it. Okay, uh, next up are, is our incidental information and reports. So uh, we have the director and principal reports, the superintendent's report, financial reports, and any other additional information. Um, we heard from Nora that the teachers did receive the staff appreciation. I don't know if uh, Ashley and Katya want to share anything about that or we're good to go. Um, Lane, do you have anything you want to add to um, your superintendent report or things you want to point out? Uh, yeah, I think I said I don't want to go over time, but the um, just more kind of incidentals. 
Um, we're currently working uh, with the state to use the RUHS field house as a vaccination site for 12 to 15 year olds um, for the Pfizer exact vaccine. Um, and we're trying to get geared up for May 21st to be the first administration and then folks will be coming back around um, the last day of school on June 11th um, for the second. And just to get the message out there that, uh, you know, it looks like this is on. Um, and we'll get more details out to the community so that they can take advantage um, of this as it happens. Ashley, I might reach out to you a little bit, depending upon their needs. They seem to be pretty self-sufficient. They're just looking um, for the space. But the one thing and kind of looking through the list that uh, we might be able to connect with Gifford on is uh, the little separators that are used um, so that there's a little privacy between the tables where the shots are administrators. Um, we have a couple from our um, you know, medical program here at, uh, at the tech center, but we might need a couple more. Uh, but as they get that list kind of finalized, I'll, I'll reach out a little bit. So just some, some good news on that front. Uh, that was great. And financially, how are things looking, Wayne? Actually really good. Um, talk a little bit about the financial report, uh, generally about this time of the year. You know, we would expect to have about 16% of our resources remaining. We're above that. Um, so we're in good shape. Uh, we'll, we will be in the black. There will be a surplus. Um, we've been scrambling around uh, probably the last month, month and a half, trying to get all the parts and pieces together that we need to kind of maximize um, the coronavirus relief funds that are coming into us, the ESSER 1, the ESSER 2, the ESSER 3. And so that's taken a lot of our time. Uh, but Robin started working today on trying to calculate what the surplus is going to be. And as soon as I have a number for that, I'll, I'll pass that along to the board. Um, one of the things that you will notice um, has changed on the financial summary sheets. If you take a look at the very first page down at the bottom, um, almost directly at the bottom, you're going to see a bunch of new lines in there um, under revenue, right? It's CRF, CRF, CRF. Um, coronavirus relief funds is what that's talking about. And this is beginning to keep track of, of what we've spent. And then it'll keep track of the reimbursements for that spending as they roll in um, so that that's stated. So this is primarily right now what you're looking at is the ESSER 1 funds, uh, which helped us get through this year, right? We had to spend a lot of it up front. And now the state is coming around, um, taking a look, making sure we spent it on what we said we did, and then providing us with the funding um, when they're assured of that. ESSER 2 will, will be the next round. Um, like I said, the recovery plan has gone to the state. They accepted the first phase of it. Um, and so we are now in the process of trying to hire about 13 or 14 individuals um, to help us uh, with getting the kids caught up from anything that they may have lost uh, during the time of COVID. So I am officially changing from being superintendent to human resources manager, along with Linda and along with Robin and most of the, the central office staff probably for the next three months as, as we try to do that. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of very good, good and positive things that are going on. But um, financial wise, we're in very good shape. Great. Uh, all right, super. Um, any, any other questions from board members? Okay. Uh, so next up, Chelsea, how, how do we do? We're actually, it's 8.15 and we're on board evaluation. Surprise. <laughs> um, really well. I thought we did really, really well this meeting. Um, mostly fives and fours. Do you want me to go through every single thing or? No, no, you can kind of give an, an overview. Yeah, it seems like we followed the agenda, stuck to the time. Um, there were opportunities for everybody to speak and many did and everyone listened and it seemed really well run today. Okay. So like five, four, four, five, four, um, five, three, four, four, four. All right. I'm kind of a high scorer, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Well, um, we're now um, going to move into an executive session um, for some personnel 
uh, issues. And can I just uh, speak? Sure. I just wanted to say the teachers and staff appreciation was well appreciated. Um, they went out last week. I've heard several people mention that they really appreciated it. So I wanted to thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you, Ashley and Katya, for organizing and putting all that together. Um, that's great. Awesome. All right. So we will head now to um, executive session. And there should be, I sent out a link earlier um, for the board. If we get in there, we don't see somebody, I'll shoot you an immediate invite. Oh, shit. I went to the wrong one. Dang it. We do have a quorum, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, you do. Five, five is a quorum for you. Move to adjourn. I second. Oh, but Anne has to take the vote, doesn't she? Uh, there she is. There she is. I went, I went into the RTCC. I was like, hey, guys. <laughs> and I moved to adjourn, and Katya se seconded. Awesome. awesome. Don't, do we have to have a statement that, uh, we, that oh, no yeah. action was taken? Always, forget that. No action was taken from executive session. So noted. Okay. So are we ready to uh, move to adjourn this meeting? Yep. Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. All right, all right. We're out. Okay. Awesome. Have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.